the detail of what texts say. Whether you can read the original Greek of Euripides Bacchi or not doesn't matter to me whatsoever. What I'm interested in, though, is what your reactions to the text are, whether you can read the Greek or whether you can read the translation. And I'm going to be assuming that you can't read the Greek, but those of you who can may be able to take away more from this session or different things from this session. Uh, the translation is from, uh, taken from David Kovacs' Low Classical Library, which is a fairly solid use of that translation of the Bacchi. So, basic exposure, showing you what the Bacchi actually is in detail, at least in terms of its uh, uh, questions about character, questions about language, that looking at it in detail in this way, in the way that I usually do these sessions, I haven't done one of these sessions for in person for three years now, so it's a nice opportunity to welcome you all here, and obviously the first time I've actually used this room, um, because this is a brand new building which we're all getting used to and really feel is fabulous and it's a new kind of major addition to our arts faculty here at Warwick. So exposure to detail. I'm going to be asking you to read these two passages in the handout, the first one first, and I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that in a minute. What I want to hear from you is your reactions. I don't want you to kind of think, oh, I've got some prepared things to say about this because, because of what my teachers might be telling me to think, or what I've been told to say, or what I've been reading, or thinking about already. What I'm really interested in from the students in the room is what you feel immediately about the questions I'm asking on the basis of the text and translation that I've given you. So, gut reactions. Um, the other thing that I'm doing, the third thing I'm really doing here, is kind of in introducing you to a style of university teaching, which is a seminar experience, really. You're on the worksheet, and you're invited to ask questions, uh, answer questions, or ask questions for yourselves on the basis of the stipulations of the worksheet. So if you want to know what a university experience is like, you're having one right now. Seminar groups in universities are tend not to be 65 people, but maybe well, like 10 or 15. But we will try to replicate some of that, hopefully today. It doesn't matter whether we get through both passages on the worksheet or not. We're going to need some stimulation. The other thing I want to give you, and I think this is perhaps most useful for thinking of Greek tragedy, actually, is I don't want you to think that there are right answers or wrong answers to take away from this session. I want you to be stimulated by the nature of the material in ways that make you feel like you want to respond to it in whatever way you, you feel like you want to respond to it. Because I think that's essential, fundamentally essential to the experience of what Greek, Greek tragedy and Greek, Greek tragic characters can do. So I'm going to be talking, first of all, getting you to talk about the first passage first, which is about characters, the main characters in the play, Dionysus and Pentheus. Dionysus is a god of wine, Dionysus is a god of madness, god of theatre, and Pentheus, uh, his victim in Thebes. The second passage, which is lower down on this sheet, but we'll come to that later, is a uh, uh, kind of really famous bit of the chorus of Bacchus. And I want you to do the same basic thing there inviting you to consider what your reactions to that might be, but reactions in, in the terms in which the passage structures your thinking about the questions I've asked you. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is invite you uh, to spend maybe five minutes more reading first passage. If you've got pens and handouts with you, uh, if you've got a handout and you've got a pen, you can scribble on it, or if you don't have to have a pen, you don't have to scribble on it, please take it away. Um, and think about ways in which um, we might begin to respond to the two questions I've asked on the basis of what this passage says. Okay, so 
because Greek tragedy is an experience based on the words that characters communicate in the theatre, or in some cases, on the page, or both. So how do we respond to that? So I'm going to give you until half past, half past 12, and then we'll have a discussion, and we'll see what anyone wants to say. Okay? So you can, you can work, work individually. If you've got small groups, you can obviously work in small groups if you want to. Um, say what you see. Say how you feel, is what I'm interested in. Your gut reactions as a starting point for what Greek tragedy can mean to you. Okay? I'll leave you to that. About the things that occurred to you in response to my questions. So my questions were two. How do we feel about Dionysus and Pentheus? On the basis of this passage, how might reflect on Pentheus' experience? These two questions are very important um, because this passage is one of the central passages, most important passages in the play for thinking about the character and experience of Pentheus and the character and experience of Dionysus and our experience of both of them in terms of language, uh, plot, theatre, presentation of character. So, does anyone want to volunteer any thoughts? Who would like to offer something about... Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, I think from this passage, I feel quite sympathetic towards Pentheus. Um, obviously, he's not exactly the greatest person in the world, but... He is at a point where he's been completely duped by Dionysus. He's been thought to think that reality is something else. So he's essentially lost control of his own perception of what is real. At this point, Pentheus doesn't know what is true. He can't understand the things that he is seeing because they're not real. Um, so Pentheus, who is trying to act in control of the situation, doesn't even know the situation he's trying to control. So in this moment, he's trying to grasp back some control when he has no clue what's going on. So he has the quick orders towards the end, sending people to go like shut the gates and man the towers, um, which are just acts of desperation because he doesn't really know what to do here. Yeah. Um, and we have Dionysus just mocking him. And even now, now that Pentheus is already gone and tried to tie him up, but tied up something which appeared to be a bull instead, or slashed down his own home, thinking he was chasing after Dionysus or the messenger Dionysus is pretending to be. So Pentheus is just completely incapable of knowing what's going on right now, and is, I guess, just sort of in a bit of a frenzy. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because Pentheus is not too likable because he definitely rejects Dionysus and the cult of Dionysus without even considering their, what they have to bring to the city. Um, but in this moment, I definitely feel sympathetic towards Pentheus because he can't have a clear mind to make his own decisions because he's just a pawn of Dionysus in this moment. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. So I suppose what I would want to... I was going to take, the, take what you were saying uh, to the next stage. What would I do? What would I ask you or anyone else to add to um, those uh, fascinating, important comments? And I would draw you, what would I do? I would draw you to consider the nature of how Dionysus actually does what he does, how he says what he says. What's, what's particularly emphasized in what Dionysus says? How is it? How is it delivered? How is it structured? Um, what language is used here that emphasizes the experience that we are having of Dionysus and the experience that we are uh, having, at least vicariously at this point, of Pentheus? So what, what might we... What might we add? I don't want to add very many things to, to, to what has already been said, because many of the things you've already said are extremely uh, pertinent. Um, I just want to flesh it out a little bit more by reference to 
the passage, the structure of the passage. Does anyone know? How do we feel? How would you, how would you characterize the tone of Dionysus's speech here? Do you have an idea? Any? Yeah. He's like gloating. He's gloating. Yeah, yeah he is. Um, do we think? How do we feel about that in the in tragedy? Is that how tragedy normally works? Do we think? How many other tragedies have you seen where characters sort of do this? We we haven't seen many tragedies where characters do this because there aren't many characters in tragedy who do this. One of the one of the points that this passage might be seen to raise is the question of tone. A question of what is the tone of Dionysus' speech? Why is that strange? What is unusual about it? Now, Pentheus responds directly, right, in line 650. Um, uh, uh, where he says, uh, your talk, yes, who, your talk is always strange, slightly higher up on the translation on the right side. Sorry, the line numbers refer to the Greek text on the left. The language you speak is always new or strange. Pentheus is remarking about the strangeness, the always strangeness, might seem a bit odd, of, of Dionysus' language. It's always new what you say. Dionysus is characterized here by the strange way he addresses and speaks about Pentheus. Why is it strange? It's totally strange because... One thing that some of you might know, but you don't need to know this, but it would, might be an additional factor, is that the meter, on the Greek, the Greek meter on the, on the, on the left-hand side, with Dionysus' speech, you can see that the lines are longer in the Greek text than at the top of the passage of Dionysus' speech than the bit afterwards where the Menopentheus turns up. Now, that meter is not the usual meter that dialogue is written in, in Greek tragedy. Dialogue in tragedy is normally written in iambic trimeters. De -dum, de -dum, de -dum, de -dum, which is what you get in the bottom half, so the lines are a bit shorter. It's three blocks, so roughly 12 symbols in each line. Top half of the passage is written in trochaic tetrameters, which reverse the iambic. So instead of de dum de dum, it goes dum de dum de. Which sounds odd, sounds weird when you read it out. So if you were performing or thinking about reading and thinking about the character of these characters in the Greek text, think with iambics. The reason why iambics are written like this for tragedy is because it's supposed to sound a bit like normal speech. Pentheus, so Dionysus is speaking in a meter, which is the opposite. It's flipped, it flipped around. And that is a meter which is much more commonly used in comedy than in tragedy. So you might think that that's totally appropriate. It might well be the, the, the answer, part of an answer, is the appropriate to Dionysus, that as God of theatre, he's able to manipulate and use different kind of theatrical effects to press his, his case. And so that tonally is very important. It throws problems to us about how do we respond. So we think, this is, is this funny? Is this comic? What do we respond? How do we respond to Pentheus? You were saying rightly, I think, that one aspect of this passage is to say, well, you feel sorry for Pentheus. But is the comic effect, is that a comic effect? Is that tonally comic? Made us make, is that supposed to make us not sympathize with Pentheus? Or feel with Dionysus? The play doesn't give you that answer. It doesn't tell you what your response should be. Um, one other thing that I wanted to emphasize here, which I will emphasize, is the language, which I think you kind of brought out a little bit. But does anyone want to say, if you were going to kind of comment on uh, one aspect, particular aspect of Dionysus' speech here, which seems kind of structurally important, what might you say? How is he, how is he explaining Pentheus' situation? He's explaining it in terms of Pentheus' experience. What is Pentheus' experience here? 
I think you probably said it already, but I'm going to particularize it and pull it out. Any ideas? Well, I'm going I'm to say, so the emphasis in, in, Pen in Dionysus' uh, speech here is on uh, imagination, right? The visions that Pentheus is having. What Dionysus is doing is narrating, in a very strange way, Pentheus' experience. He knows what Pentheus, what, what Pentheus went through but he's representing it to us in the audience as a piece of narrative. It's not being presented on stage as a piece of action, although Dionysus might be gesturing or whatever, but it's being narrated by Dionysus. So Pentheus' imagination, his vision, is being portrayed to us as a process of a narrative immersion. Right? Why does that matter? That matters because it then puts the focus on what do we, what is our experience of encountering these words? What experience are we having when we, are, we immerse ourselves in Dionysus' words and then further into thinking about Pentheus' plight? How do we imagine Pentheus' plight? And that imagination, it's that process of imagination that we're undergoing, similar to or different from Pentheus's. What makes us sure that the kind of experience we're having in theatre is different from and secure and comfortable, different from the ultimately radically disastrous experience of Dionysus that Pentheus is having. So the main point I want to draw out from this passage, alongside that bit about novelty of language, which marks out, marks out Dionysus' speech as marked in the play as strange, but new, but also maybe old as well. How old is Dionysus? How new is Dionysus? How long has he been here? How long have we been experiencing Dionysus? Is Dionysiac ritual or religion a new phenomenon or not? How new or different from the other experiences of Dionysus is this play? Is our experience of it? Those questions are very important. This point generally about how close or distant we want to be or feel we are from the experience of the central characters of this play is, I think, it's, it's one of its fundamental challenges. And you don't have to know anything about Greek religion or Greek ritual or Greek performance culture in order to have that kind of reaction, I think, when you think carefully about how a passage like this actually is structured and works as either words on the page or words being performed in the theatre. The question of how much we're implicated in this scene, in the lives of these characters and the experiences of them is, I think, fundamental to what's going on and why we're all here at all. Okay, the first passage is done. The second passage, which is also on the handout, is shorter, but raises similar and also different questions. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to read that passage. If you haven't already done it, say on the screen and on the handout. And what I want you to think about with this passage really is along similar lines to the first one. How do we understand what the chorus is saying? To what extent has it got purchase on us? So my question is, what do we feel about the moralizing force of the chorus? Whose world do, do we think they are talking about? On one level, the answer is glaringly obvious. But why does that question matter? So again, it's a question about what we feel, how we are affected by the language of Greek tragedy. Now, one aspect here which I do really want you to think carefully about is why this is distinctively Euripides. What makes Bacchae kind of the fundamentally kind of Euripidean play? 
And I think that first passage answers that question really well, because it demonstrates that Euripides is completely obsessed with the theatricality of language, and the experience of theatricality through language, and the problems that that explores. So you know, the first passage is exploratory. The second passage is also exploratory, but not in, not in the, quite the same way as the first one. While you're just reading, reading that, I will just turn over the page for others and just mention a couple of things that are going on in the bibliography. Just a kind of a heads up to some of the basic problems in thinking about Euripides, which I do not have a solution to before you ask. <laughs> um, essentially, you have the very strongly, solidly kind of ritualist historicizing uh, response of Richard Seaford that says, in order to make sense of Euripides, you have to make sense and completely understand Greek ritual and understand Dionysiac experience as fundamentally what the back is about, but it's about the community and maintaining the community and getting Athenians to think about that and the, the fundamental validity of ritual in their society. The rest of the bibliography either completely rejects that interpretation or modifies it because of what those other scholars see as Euripides' distinctive, very distinctive response to Dionysiac experience, which isn't quite, maybe, quite as clear-cut as Richard Seaford's argument wants to make. So it might be a cop-out, which is where Edith Hall might be coming from, sort of, when she says in her book that the reason why uh, the Bacchae is a quintessential uh, trans-historical Greek tragedy is because the questions it asks about Dionysiac experience are ever, ever present and um, kind of unresolved. She says, I made a reference to it, I haven't put it on the handout, but the trans-historical appeal of Bacchae is partly due to its insusceptibility, appropriate for a Dionysiac text, to any single interpretation. Might make sense for us to be thinking about the, the Bacchae at all as a, as a quintessential Greek tragedy now is because the questions and the solutions are always going to be changing and its applicability to different kinds of social conditions is going to generate different kinds of responses. That's a very important strand of what being a classicist involves. Not simply thinking about your absorption into, the extent of your absorption into, e.g., etc. Athens, but other things that matter too about our engagement with the material. Okay, so back to the chorus. It is for I lusos, kunes etos, kunes it eis oros and so forth. Extremely, what I will tell you, if I'm going to say anything about meter, on the Greek side of things here, this is completely deranged. It's out of control. Technically, the majority of the meter and the lines here are called dokmiaks, which is the language of extreme excitement and tragedy. Lots and lots of short syllables. Uh, for instance, Ezoros, Ezoros, Emo, end of line two at six. Uh, to the mountain, to the mountain, to the mountain, lots and lots and lots and lots of shorts. We're running, we're running, we're racing, we're mad, we're deranged, we're out of our minds. Right? The Greek emphasizes that more than any translation could because of the extraordinary use, let's say, of these short syllables. On you swift hands of madness onto the mountain. Okay. So, one level, we're thrown again directly into the world of this play. But we also have the chorus at the end say, let justice proceed for all to see. Let it proceed with sword in hand, stabbing through the throat of the man without God, law, or justice, the earthborn son of Ikeo. Ito de car, fanados ito, zifor, zifor, and so on. 
So the, the end of the correlate here has a, has a theme of justice, a moralizing force. How do we feel about that? What do we think that means for our understanding of a Greek tragic chorus and our understanding or interest in the kinds of questions that thinking with Greek tragic choruses might raise for us, our interpretation of Greek tragedy, but our, our broader uh, interest in um, the themes that Greek tragedy often raises. Does anyone have any immediate ideas or thoughts, reactions, comments to make? Thanks to raise. Yes, go ahead. Um, even in this respect, Pentheus is the classical tragic hero. He meets his ends by the very thing that he despised at the beginning. He reaches rejected the Bacchants and the madness and he dies in madness, and his identity is stripped away from him. Um, and you said he's likened to not a man, but a monster. Yeah. He's not a citizen of like Thebes, or a king, or a man. He's, a, he's the offspring of some lioness, or, or, or like a fallen monster. So he's dehumanized, right. So he's become other, dehumanized, in a way that these backers are kind of flipping that motif, because they are. You know, so you're going to say Bacchants are the quintessential other from the, the organized human society. That was, you know, a very obvious kind of line to take. Um, what about, you know, the man without God, law, or justice? Let justice proceed for all to see. Do we think this is just? How do we want to understand what justice means for Euripides here or the Menads, Bacchants at this point? The word justice is dike, dika in the Greek here. Dike in Greek tragedy from Aeschylus Aristia onwards has a variety of complex applicability. It can be manipulated and used by different characters to mean different things. Here, if I looked in E.R. Dodds's 1950s commentary on the play, he says, this is a song of vengeance. Right? You could translate Dika as kind of, you know, vengeance in a sense. It's a rightful end of the, the quest for, for vengeance that Pentheus is kind of, this play is driving, on, on, uh, driving us on to, to, um, to see in the end, or feel in the end. We'd feel about, but what do we feel about the relation between that idea of justice, or that, that idea of vengeance, and again, the tone and the structure of the language, the effect of the language in performance. Do we feel that makes sense? Do we feel that it should make sense? Do we want to subscribe to this view of justice? Do we want to say, oh well, it's okay because we know better than Pentheus does, and these minads aren't real, their views aren't real, they're imagined. So Dionysiac experience isn't really like this, is it? This isn't what normally happens to people. Is this, is this, is this a straight thing to draw off? A lot, can you draw a straight line of, say, civic communal morality out of a passage like this? Maybe you can. Maybe you can, but you, you might have to do a certain amount of kind of playing around to make that argument work. And you read this passage, and that might not be the most natural thing to say in response to it. I know that, you know, say you read Richard Seaford, and that's where he would be very much coming from. But I want to kind of give you a sense from reading the passage in detail and thinking about what it does in its sound, in its language, in its detail, that that's not the only possible reaction to it. We might be, we might be a bit worried, right? The extent to which this is justice is justice for us. Do we think that decay, justice, is the same in our world as it is in this world? Does that make sense? Do we want that kind of world? 
Is that the world we're already in? Are we in a theatre? Dionysus, Dionysus' space? Is that not just the experience we're already having? What is the experience we're having? So that basic dynamic, the dynamic about what we think justice even means in this passage, is, is again really important for us to reflect on the extent to which we feel committed maybe committed as an operative word here, right, to being part of this world. Why that matters for the chorus. Why is, this, why is it important that the chorus is saying this rather than a character? It could have been a character saying this. It could have had, I don't know, Cadmus or Tiresias saying this. But the fact that the chorus is saying it, what's the difference between a chorus saying something, or singing, in this case, wildly singing something. What is that about the chorus that matters compared with thinking about a mythological character like Dionysus or Pentheus or religious character like Dionysus in a play? I think the differences are effect with the chorus versus the character. Any, any right, last, last minute thoughts about what choruses do in tragedies as opposed to what characters do? Um, I think the chorus often will act as a, sort of a bridge between the narrative and the audience. Um, there, there are no one character, so they very often don't have, well, they don't really have the biased viewpoints of certain characters in the play, although this is perhaps the one example where they do. Um, which is what's really interesting about the chorus of the Bacchae. Um, in most examples, you see the chorus as, I guess, the moral force, um, who are talking about the events of the play and are relaying them to the audience. They're extracting from, right, exactly, so they're oscillating. They're extracting from the world of the myth into the world of the audience. But they're also representing, the other point about the chorus is they're not one, they're a group. So they're representing what it might be to be a group. What you're saying there about the Bacchae chorus is, is important, yes. Um, another play, there are a couple of plays I would, I would invite you to consider that do really weird things with choruses. One is Aeschylus Eumenides, where the chorus are both moralized, a moralizing force of general terms and the most gruesome sights you've ever seen on the stage, right? within the mythological world, within the plot of the unfolding mythological kind of revenge and uh, a trial of Orestes. The other play that I would invite you to think about would be the chorus of Sophocles Philoctetes, where the chorus are shipmates of Odysseus who are trying to trick, along with Odysseus and Neoptolemus, Philoctetes into doing what they want. They are spectacularly not on his side, so they sing a call out saying, yes, he's asleep, great, let's steal the boat, sort of thing. So, tragic choruses, both all the way through from Aeschylus in the Eumenides of 458 right through to the end of the 5th century, the end of tragedy with the Bacchae, does weird things with choruses. It doesn't always have to be that kind of uh, straightforward, yes, it's a moralizing force that we can read out. We can separate that out from the mythological realm, the mythological space. Um, again, the extent to which Euripides is different is, a, is partly a, a point of degree and also kind of uh, an issue of the extent to which we know anything about, enough about how many tragedies we don't actually have. What I would say with Euripides and Euripides' choruses that make this another example of a distinctively kind of extra pushed, you know, Euripides is pushing the boat even further out is the way in which Euripides' choruses quite frequently play out perspectives that may not cohere. Uh, so choruses in Sophocles' Electra, for instance. What perspective on the characters and the broader plot of that play does do the choruses in Euripides uh, provide? Not very, not very straightforward, not very obvious. So I think you know, Euripides is, 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 once again, just experimenting with, playing around with, tragic form, the expectations of what choruses do 
for, for audiences who have experienced all kinds of different audience, uh, kinds of choral experiences with Greek theatre. Um, and, and that's also what I would say, again, about the first passage with Dionysus speaking calmly. Is he speaking calmly? Is he speaking jovially? How, we, how is Dionysus speaking there? That question is raised by the resonance of tro trochaic tetrameters, the meter of that, which is partly comic something that Euripides uses again, like it, it only uses really late on in his career, but it has a very strong comic tradition. So the question of tone, the question of the extent to which Euripides is pushing the boat out, doing things, doing things that challenge us to think about our experience of theatre, our experience of Greek religion, our experience of ritual, experience of Dionysus, and think about how we're accessing the material, and how we're responding to it. I think that cuts across both the passages. So there are no right or wrong answers. The bibliography demonstrates that. The quotes I put on the handout when they say completely opposite things about how to understand the Bacchae kind of do that. But fundamentally, which is why I put the Plato Laws passage on at the end, you have to understand that being absorbed in choruses matters culturally for the Greeks, to understand the kinds of people they might be. So when, when um, the Athenian in Plato's Law says, Apaidutos, akarutos, untrained in choral performances equals uneducated, the whole point here is we're learning stuff. We're thinking, we're trying to figure out what it is to be a human being, we're trying to figure out what it is to be religious, we're trying to think about what it is to live in communities or not. Right. Thank you very much. Have some lunch, I think, now. Thank you very much for...